PBS Utah presents the Governor's Monthly News Conference, an exchange between Utah reporters and Governor Spencer Cox. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It's great to see you. I hope you had a wonderful summer. It's hard to believe that summer is uh, is mostly over, I guess. Uh, my daughter started school today. We have school kids going back to school all across the state of Utah this week and next week. And uh, I, I just want to uh, take this moment to thank our, our students um, and our parents for uh, for the important work that they do, but but especially our teachers as they're headed back. As as some of you know, um, I had an opportunity to, uh, to spend time as a substitute teacher last year in a middle school and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Uh, it just gave me a deeper appreciation for, for our teachers. Um, I, I was planning to use this as my, my opening statement, spend a little more time on, on teachers and students, um, but it, I, I'm going to take a little prerogative maybe and, and talk about something else. Um, we, uh, we, we lost a, a friend yesterday, um, uh, someone who died by suicide uh, unexpectedly and, and tragically. Um, and sadly, we have, uh, we have far too much of that in, in our state and in our country and uh, in our society today. It's, it's, it's no secret that Utah has, a, has a, a high suicide rate as compared to the, the rest of the nation. I think we're, we're, we have the sixth highest rate in the nation right now. It's something that's always on my mind, uh, but, but specifically, uh, because of, of, of yesterday and, uh, and, and because uh, I'm thinking of my own kids as we're heading back to school, uh, these are very d difficult times in, in our country. Um, we, we know that, uh, that um, mental health problems have been exacerbated over the past several years, even before COVID, uh, but, but especially coming out of the pandemic. And so, so if I might just use this as an opportunity um, to to ask people in the state of Utah, um, first of all, if, if you are suffering from, from depression or anxiety, if you're, if you're struggling or having thoughts of suicide, um, I, I would beg you, um, first of all, please stay. We need you. Uh, we need you here in our state. You are so important. I've, I've been where you are. Um, I've, I, I've, I've shared this before, but as, as, a, as a youth growing up, I, I struggled with, with suicide ideation, and um, it's 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 not uncommon. Um, you you are certainly not alone if you are feeling those things, and there you, you are not broken. There is nothing there is nothing um, unfixable about you. Uh, you are we we need you, and we need you here. So please please reach out and get help. We have more resources than ever before. Um, we have a, a new suicide prevention hotline, uh, like like nine one one only for for mental health. It's it's nine eight eight, and uh, at the push of three buttons you can can immediately be connected with a professional who can help you uh, through through that crisis. Um, please talk to a friend, a family member, a counselor, a coworker, um, anyone just talking about it we know has the ability to reduce um, the, the chances of, uh, of, of an attempted suicide. And, and then to those who aren't, um, aren't feeling that, that way right now, I would ask you all to reach out to your family members and your friends and do something very simple. Just ask a simple question. Uh, ask, have you thought about suicide? Um, and if so, have you thought about it recently? Now, I know that's kind of a scary, scary question to ask, and sometimes we think that if we, if we talk about it, it may put ideas in someone's head. Uh, the research is very clear that that is not true, that that is not a thing. Um, in, in fact, the opposite is true, that just by bringing it up, just by talking about it, even if the person has been thinking about it and they're not willing to talk right now, knowing that you're the type of person that is open and willing to have that conversation with them is sometimes enough um, to keep them here and when they're ready, they, they will talk to you. And, and I, I know the second part of this is, is even more scary. What if the person says, yes, what do I do then? Um, well, you don't have to have all the answers and, and we don't expect you to have all the answers. But um, I, I think of there's some great training out there called QPR training. Think about CPR for saving a, a physical life. QPR is, is how we save someone who, who's in crisis. So the first is question, that's the cue. And you just ask that question. Um, the second part of that is just persuade. And, and that is we 
we, we persuade the person to get some help, professional help. And again, we have lots of, uh, we have, uh, uh, lots of institutions that can help with that, 988 being the, the easiest, um, but there are many others and, and uh, easy to find in the state. Um, the Safe Utah app is another one that we recommend, um, especially for our young people. It's in uh, about 90% of our schools now, um, including higher education. Every child and every parent should have access to the Safe Utah app. At the push of a button on your smartphone or device, um, you can immediately be in contact with one of our professionals at the University of Utah who could, who could help. And then the R is for refer. So we persuade them to get help and then we refer them to one of these, um, one of these lifelines to help protect lives. Um, if, we, if we will all do that uh, today, tomorrow, this week, throughout this year, uh, I, I know we can save more lives and uh, we, can, uh, we, we, we can do better here in the state of Utah. So on, on that so somber note, um, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions that you might have. Please. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, like everybody know, most of the kids are back to school at this point. Any concerns about safety school measures? And what would you tell to parents and teachers uh, in general, especially when Uvalde shootings, it still sure. feels so close. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, so, so one of the resources that I just mentioned is is the Safe Utah app. And while it's mostly used for um, for mental health, there is an, an, another piece to that app that has been so helpful here in the state of Utah. And that is that it gives, um, it gives kids and parents the ability anonymously um, to connect with, uh, with law enforcement uh, to report any type of suspicious activity Activity that may be out there, any type of bullying. Um, it's been very successful for that. Um, we've gotten over the past year close to 300 tips that have come in, and uh, some of those some of those tips have involved the potential for violence, and so an opportunity to intervene early and uh, and, and do everything possible to prevent that from happening. Over the course of the summer, um, our Department of Safety has been working very closely with school districts and the, the state superintendent, the state school board, um, all across the state. State, uh, to make sure that they are continuing to implement safety measures in uh, in every one of our schools, uh, making sure that there is, is a proper training, um, that, that we have the ingress and egress figured out in a way that will add additional safety. And uh, and so we're working very closely to, uh, to do everything we can to keep students safe. We have resource officers in many of our schools, not all of our schools, but many of our schools have, have uh, resource officers that are there and available. Uh, these are law enforcement officers that are there uh, every day um, to uh, to help with any issues that come up in the school and uh, and so we're, we're, we're certainly hoping that we will have a safe school year and doing everything we can to make that possible. Governor, the legislature this year may be poised to repeal the ban on LGBTQ conversion therapy. Uh, you were a supporter of the ban when you yeah. were lieutenant governor. Your thoughts on, on whether they go this route, if they'll go this route? whether you'll oppose it. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, I believe there's a hearing on it today. Um, again, I've, I've been in meetings, and so I'm not sure if that's already happened or is happening now or, or will happen later today. Um, we're all obviously watching it very closely. Um, if you'll remember, Governor Herbert, who was the governor at the time, uh, there, was, uh, there was some proposed legislation that, that ended up not going anywhere. Um, at, at the encouragement of many legislators, uh, Governor Herbert asked the, uh, the Department of Commerce that, that oversees uh, the, 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 uh, the, the regulation of certain practices and businesses in the state through Doppel. Um, and uh, they, they went through a process, a very public process. Uh, they developed a rule. There were public hearings on that rule and, uh, and, and then put that rule into place. And so, uh, of course, we've, we've been supportive and continue to be supportive of that rule. Uh, there has been some litigation over the past couple years um, since that happened in other jurisdictions, not here. And uh, we, we are watching that litigation closely. Um, to uh, to see how that turns out, we will engage with the legislature if this is something they decide that they want to. They've always had the ability to 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 deal with this. Um, this is certainly nothing new, and it, and it certainly is within their prerogative. Um, I think we we again, as as I've admonished many times, we have to be incredibly careful uh, for some of the reasons that, that I just mentioned. Um, we know that historic practices around conversion therapy have, have been incredibly damaging, and there is plenty of research on on that issue. 
and uh, obviously we have we have free speech issues as well that that are important and uh, the ability of people to uh, to get the type of help that they deem in, uh, necessary for for them and their families but in a way that doesn't harm our, our, our kids and uh, and so I, I think it's always appropriate to go back and review the rules that we have in place see if they're working as intended um, that probably hasn't happened yet and probably needs to happen uh, but uh, but I, I don't know that anything has changed as far as the concerns that I've expressed earlier so again we haven't seen any legislation I have no idea if they're actually going to uh, to take something on like that but um, rule review is something very important in fact we've set up structures to review all of our rules routinely uh, to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and I have no problem with reviewing this rule as well Governor, after their daughter were beat, uh, uh, daughters were beat by a girl in sports, some Utah parents triggered an investigation into whether she was transgender, and the school opened the girl's enrollment records dating back to kindergarten to confirm she was female. Do you have any concerns about this situation, and do you think fair play concerns justify parents lodging these types of complaints? Well, certainly I have a concern about that. Um, it's that, you know, I, I learned about that yesterday. I was, I was not aware of that. I think everybody kind of learned about that yesterday um, in, in a hearing where, where that was proposed. Um, you know, my, my goodness, we, we're, we're living in this world where um, we've become uh, sore losers and, uh, you know, we're looking for any reason uh, to to, to figure out why our kid lost, um, it, it's um, it, it, I, I, I have a real problem with that story. I don't know all the details other than what was what was shared there, but I just I just wish you know we could um, we, we could be a little more thoughtful uh, in life and and a little less critical of other people. Um, I, I appreciate that there has to be fairness in in the way that we administer the rules and everyone has to follow the rules, but making up. Um, uh, allegations like that are, are pretty disturbing to me and I would certainly hope that we don't have any of that in the future. So anything more that should be done is, you know, the well, conversation about HB 11 continues? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything that can be done there. Again, um, there are unreasonable parents everywhere, um, uh, always. It, it's from from uh, from Little League to, to, to college sports and professional sports. Uh, I've been guilty of it myself where I've uh, I've yelled at refs in the past, and I've been a ref who parents have yelled at. We uh, we, we get really involved in, 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 in our kids as we should. Um, but sometimes that can go a little too far, uh, where we've had threats of violence against referees in, in soccer leagues across the nation, football, baseball, softball. Uh, we, we've seen some very poor sportsmanship. Usually it's the parents and not the kids. Um, we've seen some great examples of, of sportsmanship in the Little League World Series this year and, and in other places. So um, so I, 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 just, I, I just think we would all be a little better off if we would take a step back and, and uh, give a little more grace in these in in these options but I, I don't know that there's anything legally we could do to to, to change that so Sean welcome. Governor, I'd like to ask you about the recently passed inflation reduction act you said earlier this year that we need to innovate our way out of the climate crisis by yeah. looking toward new clean energy technologies like wind solar and nuclear while also bolstering, bolstering domestic oil and gas production here the inflation reduction act contains items that address both of those things what is your take on the energy provisions in the IRA and what could it mean for Utah's energy sector sure thank you yeah I I, I do believe that it's it's closer to a better approach there there are lots of things in in the um, in the IRA that I, I disagree with uh, including the name um, but uh, but but I as far as energy goes and, and this is really important um, the uh, we have an opportunity here in the state of Utah for that kind of all of the above approach and that that will ultimately lead to much better outcomes and I'm, I'm, I'm just a firm believer in that and so I, I appreciate that there is an emphasis and I think this is mostly because of Senator Manchin that we do have an emphasis on, on kind of both sides of that that ledger and uh, it will those those can be and, and we expect will be very positive for the state of Utah we're, we're a place that has tremendous potential around solar um, uh, tremendous potential around wind we have uh, we have potential for, with geothermal um, and 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 we're working with other states uh, including Colorado on that um, we've got a big hydrogen project that we're working on with multiple states and so that will benefit us as well um, perhaps the, the the most important thing though I think that can come out of that legislation 
is something that wasn't in the legislation, but we were told was part of the deal to get that legislation done, and that is um, permitting reform uh, that, uh, that that was promised to Senator Manchin. Now, whether or not that promise will be fulfilled, we don't know, but but I'm, I'm certainly hopeful. And when, when I talk about um, permitting reform, um, I'm, I'm referring to mostly to NEPA, um, which is a, a law that requires, it's an environmental protection law, um, theoretically, uh, that, that requires a whole bunch of hoops that you have to jump through before you can do build a project on, on public land. Um, and uh, unfortunately, what, what it has done is it, it has prevented or, or greatly slowed down or, or greatly increased the cost of big projects that, that even projects we know will be good for the environment, uh, like solar and wind. And um, the, the, the one, one major area that we're really running into right now, and, and the Biden administration is aware of this, um, and, and I will tell you that as I met with my fellow governors, both Republicans and Democrats, they're very concerned about this, it's the ability to get um, transmission lines where they need to go. So the transmit electricity, as we're trying to electrify um, so much of, of what we do, especially vehicles to lower emissions, uh, we have got to be able to get that electricity being produced by wind, solar, geothermal, uh, hydrogen, uh, gas, uh, natural gas, even coal, be able to get that to where th where it needs to go so, w so we can do this. And we're having we ha we're having a really hard time in the West because of NEPA and that permitting process. It, it can take seven to 10 years. Um, we're just now building a transmission line in Utah that I was working on as a county commissioner in 2006, 2007, and it's just now getting built. Um, so so if you really care about the climate and you, you care about reducing emissions, you have to we have to find ways to uh, greatly increase the speed at which we're able to build these these transmission lines. In the east, it's a little less about NEPA and more about um, right of ways. They, they don't have as much public land, but so they're going through private land and really struggling to be able to make that happen as well. And it's it's often the same environmentalists that are pushing for these new technologies that are holding back these projects that are so necessary. And so that's one area where I do think Republicans and Democrats can come together and make a big difference. Given those opportunities and hurdles, do you think yeah. Utah could someday kick fossil fuels altogether? Well, I, I, I suspect that as a, as, a, as a nation, as a world, that eventually we will. Yeah, I, I think that's very possible. Um, but the, the mistake that, that this administration is making, um, and uh, we're seeing that with, with some of the other rules that they, they've promulgated uh, that, that, are going to, uh, that are going to shut down some of those fossil fuels prematurely before we have both the uh, the amount of energy that we need from other sources and before we have uh, sources that are sustainable in that um, the, the, pro the problem with wind and solar and every everybody knows this is that it's it's not great for a base load um, because if the wind doesn't blow or the Sun doesn't shine um, then then you don't have that sustainable load and so that's when coal and natural gas are so so very important and uh, if you shut that down um, prematurely until these other technologies technologies are, are ready, then all you're going to do is increase inflation, you're going to hurt those that, uh, that are struggling the most, and you're going to get a backlash, um, as we've seen in other places, to these new, new energies. And so there is, a, there is a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. And, and again, by, by supporting all of these, we're doing it the right way. And then when, when, when those energies are more sustainable, when we have uh, battery capacity that can handle a base load that, uh, that is now being carried by coal and natural gas, then we we can start to, uh, to, to significantly reduce our reliance on those other energy sources. Please, Governor, now. yesterday the Director of Forestry, Fire and State Lands called the Utah Lake Islands proposal unconstitutional and not legally sound. Uh, your thoughts on that declaration and should that put a stop to this proposal? What are your thoughts on where we go from here on that? Sure. Well, uh, as I've said before, um, I am a huge proponent in working to improve and, and preserve Utah Lake. I think it is one of the best assets and most underutilized assets we have in this from, a, from, from just a natural beauty, uh, recreation standpoint, a, a ability to enjoy that, that incredible lake front. It's every year, um, it's, it's getting, it, it's been worse. Now, there have been some improvements, slight improvements as, as we've seen, but um, the, the pollution levels in, in that lake, uh, the, the algal blooms that happen routinely every year, 
year. In fact, we're, we're having one right now that make it so you, you, you can't go into the lake and, and, and can't boat on the lake. Um, th those are big issues. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in dredging. Dredging is happening all over the world and has for generations. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity to deepen that, that lake, um, I I improve the, the wildlife habitat, the, the fishery in the lake, and, uh, and, and again, just improve the overall e ecosystem and health of that lake. Now, as far as that specific project, um, I've, I've never given it a, a full-throated endorsement. I've said we have to look at everything, every opportunity. It's going to be very expensive. And if we can find private partners that will help carry the load so taxpayers don't have to carry all of that burden, we should certainly be open to that and look at it. Um, now, I have not seen the legal analysis around, um, uh, around that report that came out yesterday yet, uh, but certainly I will take time to, uh, to, to look at that. Um, I, we, have, uh, we have great teams in, in, in the attorney general's office who has been working with um, the, the, that division on this particular issue. And so I certainly trust their legal analysis. I, I suspect that there may be some litigation around this, so I have to be careful um, weighing in anyway. But, uh, but I, so, so let me just say this. We have to do more for Utah Lake. We have a, a bill, um, a piece of legislation that I signed that created this, uh, this Utah Lake Commission that will be working specifically on that issue. But there was nothing in that legislation that pointed them towards this particular idea or this particular project. So their job is to look at, at all available resources, look at all available ideas, and then come back with some proposals for, for, for me and, and for the legislature, and we'll look forward to those proposals. Is Utah going to be forced to make more cuts or to have to take less water out of the Colorado River, regardless of whether you want to negotiate for fair shares or not, is the reality there's just not going to be water there? Oh, you, sure, yeah. I, I think that's. I think that kind of is is, is kind of goes without saying. I'll, I'll say it anyway, Ben. I think it's important, and I I think um, the, uh, the the chair of our Utah Colorado River Commission said as much as well uh, th this week. Uh, Gene said that that look, we're all every state is going to have to have to cut back. We we know that uh, that we're never going to get what what was our fair share, what we had been promised, because the hydrology of the river is just not there. Um, we we certainly hope that uh, that that it will be um, someday, uh, but, but it is not right now. And so we have these agreements in place. Um, we, we know the reality is that, uh, that the lower basin states have used more than, than their allocation. We've used less than our allocation, but there's not enough for all of our allocations. And so we're, we're all going to have to cut back. Um, the question will be is how, how do we fairly distribute that cutback among the states? And those are the conversations that are ongoing. Governor, Time Magazine had a story out about you today with the headline, The Red State Governor Who's Not Afraid to Be Woke. Your thoughts about that story? And oh, have you received any reaction? It's a stupid reaction? headline. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, I, look, th th that headline is doing the exact same thing that I rail against. Um, it's... Uh, it, 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 being being kind and trying to bring people together is is very different than being woke, and um, I, I I think it's I, I I just completely disagree with it. I, I think it's a, a trash headline. It's it's not accurate, and uh, and and yet um, I, I I did get a chance just before I came in. I kind of skimmed the article. Um, there are some things in there that I that, that I think are fair. Um, certainly, I have been outspoken in trying to uh, trying to bring people together in in a positive way. Um, I, I stated in there. That that I'm, I'm not trying to own the libs, I'm trying to convince the libs that there's a better way. Um, that's, that's not being woke, that, that is very different. I, I think we have a problem with cancel culture and wokeness, and uh, I, I think it's, it's deeply problematic, and I think it's adding to the divide in, in, our, in our nation. I have no idea where that word came from, certainly wasn't used in any of the interviews, and I have no idea why they would, uh, why they would choose that headline. What's the message you would want to get out about that story? Well, the, the message is this. Um, look, if, if, if you care about our country, uh, and you care uh, about the future of our country and, and these freedoms that, that, that we hold so dear, we are going to have to learn to, uh, to work with people who are different than us. We've done that in the past. And by the way, we do that here in Utah very, very well. We're not perfect. And you can all point to lots of examples where, where we are not. Um, and, and those get the headlines. Um, and, and I suspect this was a clickbait headline as well. It, it, it's, it's, I, I think it's very interesting and telling to me that there's an entitled article pushing against clickbait um, that then uses clickbait uh, to, to try to get people to, uh, to, to read the article. And, uh, and, and so that's where I think we, we have to do better. I, I'm a conservative, and 
I hold certain principles very dear. And, and, and I thought, I, I, I grew up thinking that the whole idea was that I try to convince, as a conservative, I try to convince other people that, uh, that what I believe um, is a better way uh, to, to live and to govern. Um, now we've gotten to a place where both conservatives and liberals have decided that um, that you are that, that that this is some sort of quality that that no one can change, and that we need to kick everyone out that isn't exactly like us, and we need to surround ourselves with people that are only exactly like us. And when I say exactly like us, I mean 100 percent like us. Um, that uh, that is so anti-American. Um, it's and and it's 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 incredibly damaging. And social media has made that made that much easier. And so I'm going to continue to work um, across the aisle uh, to find solutions um, and to, to try to uh, help people see that there's a different way and, and hopefully a better way. I'm going to continue to work within my own party um, to do more of that as well, to try to bring people together and, and help us uh, be a, a, a little less strident in, uh, in kicking people out who agree with us 95% of the time and uh, seeing if we can't uh, build some bridges there. And that's that's what I was trying to get across when, when, uh, when I was interviewed, and, and hopefully that comes through in the article. I would, I would always encourage people, and I think everyone in this room would support me in this. Um, most of you, I don't think any of you, write your own headlines. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I think that's something that should change in your industry. I think that uh, that's a huge mistake. If I, if I can give you just a piece of advice, uh, I think it would be much better if the people who wrote the articles got to choose the headlines. Um, but I would also say, don't look at headlines. Actually read what's in there. I think you would appreciate me saying this. Um, far too often people just look at the headline, form an opinion, and move on, and I, I would encourage you not to do that. Have you received any reaction from your constituents about that, that headline? Did you well, not any? yet, because I don't think anybody's read it yet, so um, we'll see. I, I, I only saw it about a half hour before, before this started. So. I'm, there's always political consequences. We live in a really stupid age. Okay, on that note, we're going to end our television portion of the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us for the PBS monthly news conference with the governor, and we'll see you back here next month. Okay, we are going to get to some remote reporters. We want to go with Chris Reed in St. George. Go ahead with your question. By the way, that was a great way to end. We live in a stupid age. And with that, we're out. <laughs> so that's perfect. No, you're the fine. Timing, you're the timing worked out that way. Chris, go ahead. <laughs> Well, well, Governor, I hope this isn't a stupid question, but, uh, you, you know, the, the, the big top down here, um, I'm actually going to turn to sports, is, is our local little leaguers, and, and obviously also the recovery of uh, Easton Oliverson. Uh, you've been talking a lot about, on Twitter, about the Snow Canyon, Santa Clara All-Stars, and, and, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of, I don't hope, I hope you don't mind if I ask you this, but as a child, when you were their age, 12 or 11, were you a ball player? And in all honesty, were you the kid who would make the big catch or drop the ball? And <laughs> does that give you an appreciation for what these kids are doing? Uh, great, great question, Chris. And, and you can ask me these, these tough questions anytime. Um, I, I appreciate it. By the way, I just want to say how, how happy I am and how excited I am for, for, um, for our team, uh, the, those Santa Clara kids, um, the Snow Canyon All-Stars. They, uh, they're, they're living my dream. So yes, I was a ball player. Um, uh, in, in fact, baseball and my, my basketball were my favorite sports. Baseball was probably the sport I was, uh, I, I was best at. I was a pitcher and uh, and then played second base when I when I wasn't pitching um, I in in my freshman year of high school during tryouts so tryouts went two weeks um, the Saturday in between when we didn't have tryouts I uh, I was playing pickup basketball with my friends and I broke my thumb on my right hand um, they put a cast on uh, they took it off a month later and my thumb had healed crooked so I had to have it rebroken literally they just they just put me out and the doctor just rebroke it and uh, I had to recast it again and I missed the entire season and that was kind of it um, uh, because I had missed that season I was I was just so far behind uh, my my pitching, my thumb is still a little crooked. It, it kind of threw things off, and so that, that was it. So I became a tennis player after, after that. But I loved baseball. I love baseball. Um, again, I, I, I would have given anything to be able to play at this level. I, I like to think I'm the guy who would have caught the ball and, and, and not dropped the ball, but uh, we, we all have a few of those bloopers on our, on our highlight reels from, uh, from, from our younger days. I, I do have to say, though, I don't want to brag, but we just had an executive versus legislative game of softball two nights ago. Um, I 
I was uh, I, I, I pitched and played second base again, and uh, we beat the legislature 14-11. I, I just I, you know it's fine. I, I I just thought I should get that out there. I wish I would have done that when we had more viewers, but I hope you'll all report that later. Thanks. Okay, Parker with KPCW, go ahead with your question. Hey, Governor. Nightly rentals are proliferating around Utah and Park City leads with 43% of our housing stock being short-term rentals. You've mentioned in the past that Airbnbs and VRBOs contribute to the state's housing crisis and you've also talked about the need for density. Do you think strictly regulating nightly rentals would help move the needle there? And what would it take for the legislature to consider that? Yeah, so we're, we're having those conversations right now with the legislature and, and, and we want to be careful. Look, I, I'm, I, I've used Airbnbs, uh, VRBOs, uh, the, those, those nightly rentals. Um, I, I think they're great. There's obviously a demand for that in, in the economy. And so I, I think we want to be careful to try to find that balance um, and, and, and try to understand what that, what that balance is. Um, there's been lots of discussions about how we can, we can figure that out. And uh, they're, they're still ongoing. So I, I just want to be careful. I think one of the ideas that is out there, though, is that we would, we would give back um, a, a little bit of authority to our, our local municipalities to decide how they want to regulate those those those, uh, those homes those those rentals in 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 their own markets um, they were doing that before we pulled a little bit of, of that back uh, but that was before we had such a housing crisis and because of the way things have changed I, I do think by the way that it, that it could move the needle as as we know um, basically we have we have a good understanding about what the shortage is in our state very similar by the way to the rest of the nation um, there's a uh, I, I, th I think we're, we're somewhere in the 40,000 uh, unit range, and, and I think across the nation it's somewhere in the 4 million range. Those were some numbers I, I heard in the past week. I, I don't have the, those numbers right at my fingertips, so and so that that would be about right. You know, we're we're about one percent of the the nation, and and so that that seems right. And and if we have. Some estimates are we've got about 25,000 uh, nightly rentals, uh, homes that are, that are being rented out. You, you can, you can kind of do the math and see where that goes. Now, we're not going to eliminate them. That, that's not, that's not in, on anyone's radar, um, but, but certainly making sure that, that we're, we're careful in finding that balance and, and making sure there's enough housing here for, for kids and grandkids that want to live in the state is important. So I think you'll see some legislation around that this year. Governor, your thoughts on Liz Cheney's defeat in Wyoming next door and, and what that means for Republicans? Well, I, again, I, I don't think it was a surprise to anyone. We, we know it's a, it's a tumultuous time with, within the Republican Party and, and, and the Democratic Party. Uh, there, this, this is a divide that's been around for a while. Uh, and so uh, we, you, have a, you have a very red state. Um, I don't think the polls were ever close. And, and so, so, so look, I've, you know, I, I've talked about this a lot. Um, I, I always admire anyone in both parties, even if I completely disagree with them. I admire anyone who is willing to stand up and, and say what they believe, especially at the cost of, of them losing whatever it is. I admire Democrats who do that. I admire Republicans who do that. And uh, I, I, I think that that's, that's important. Um, I, I don't know that it's a, it, sometimes we build these things up. Like this is a, this is a congressional race in the, one of the smallest states in the nation, right? Um, there are 435 members of Congress. And so there are some lessons that, that I'm sure can be pulled out of this one, but this is a decision that was made by the, the voters of, of Wyoming. I don't know much about uh, the, the person she ran against. Um, and, and so I, I, I have no idea, you know, maybe she's great, maybe she's not. I, I just don't know. It's not a race that I was engaged in or followed much at all, other than kind of, you know, the headlines in a couple articles and knowing that it wasn't going to be particularly close. So um, as a party, we're going to have to figure this out over the, the next couple years as we go into 2024. You know, who's going to run? Who's going to be the nominee? What does that look like? Um, I'm certainly plotting a different path than, than President Trump plotted. Um, I've, I've said that many times before. We're, we're very different. Like if, if you want a, a governor who is exactly like Donald Trump, like I'm Probably not your guy. <laughs> I, uh, I I I I I like to work with the other side. I, I like to kind of bring people together. Um, that certainly was not his style. I, I don't think most people, even some people who want that as a president, I don't think that's what they want as a governor. At least I, I hope that's the case. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly there is a portion of my party that that's what they want. You know, they want somebody that is just going to use hyperbole and, and, uh, and, 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 and um, uh, sadly, in, in this case, again, uh, with, with the January 6th stuff that I've been 
very outspoken on um, using uh, using unfounded allegations of of fraudulent elections, and, and I, I do think that that's that's very damaging. And I certainly hope that that uh, that more and more um, Republicans will work together to try to uh, to try to restore that uh, that 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 belief and integrity in our election systems. And we've we've been trying to do that here in the state of Utah as well. Okay, we'd like to go to David with the Spectrum with a virtual question. Go ahead. Hey, hey Governor. Hey, David. We spoke a minute ago about we spoke a minute ago about Utah's stake in the Colorado River. You mentioned this kind of idea that maybe sometime in the future, if the river's flows are strengthened, we, we may still be able to access that water. But but in the short term, that doesn't look realistic. Yeah. Uh, the, the Lake Powell pipeline, of course, has always been described down here as the key for southwestern Utah to keep up with its population growth. Um, so more of a point of clarification, really, is when you talk about the potential for that project to be delayed further, do you envision some need to restrict growth in some way down here, or do you feel there's enough water to be found in smarter use, conservation, to, to keep this area on the same trajectory for that growth? It's a great question. It's an important question, and I'm not trying to demur here at all. But but I, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, there are people that are a lot smarter than I am, and and one of the things we did this year that I think was so important is we made that law. Um, there, there is now a requirement in law that, that every municipality, um, every uh, every single building permit that is issued has to have uh, an assurance of water tied to it. So yet our ability to grow in, in not just not just in, in southern Utah, but throughout Utah, will be strictly dependent on our ability to make sure that we have enough water available. There's two ways we can do that, right? Um, one way is to have new sources of water, um, and, and that means you know new reservoirs, new water storage, or uh, the, or the other way is to uh, to cut back on the amount that we use per capita, and, th and then we can add people. We are doing a very good job this year. Utahns, actually, the last two years have done an amazing job of really pulling back um, and and using less water, which will allow us again to have enough water for our kids and grandkids and and, and that's going to be different in every single uh, water conservancy district uh, across the state and so that 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 question that you just asked will be dependent on how much um, how much people are able to cut back on their water usage there uh, how much water is available with the current resources and then with future planning are there other ways that we're able to get water there whether it's because the hydrology of the the river increases and we're able to build the lake power pipeline or, or some other way. And, and I know that uh, the, the water managers in, in your neck of the woods are, are some of the best in the world, and uh, they're working very diligently to answer those questions. I, I would also mention that almost every year we we do have a municipality or two that stops um, issuing building permits because they don't have enough water uh, for, to to continue growth. Now they've they've been smaller municipalities. We had one in Sampy County a couple years ago as they were working to drill a new well and and uh, make sure that they had the the, the water necessary for that. Uh, but but that does happen. And so I, I do suspect that if the drought continues in the future, there probably will be a, a few pockets in the state where where that might be the case. There is a lot of discussions about piping water sure. into the state from out of state, to southern Utah, to the Great Salt Lake, to other portions of Utah. But how realistic and feasible is that? Yeah, it, it, the, I don't know how realistic and feasible it is. And that's why um, the, the studies are being done, uh, Ben, is to try to understand, is it feasible? How expensive would it be? And, and I think it's important to note that we're, we're not on an island here. This is not a Utah drought. This is a, a, a Western United States drought. So we're not the only ones looking at these questions. Um, you know, Nevada, Arizona, California. Um, we're all trying to understand: Are there other uh, other ways to do this? And 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 is there a possibility? By the way, we've we've had extensive droughts in other parts of the country before too. All right, um, Texas, the Midwest have have had a, a, a times of extreme drought, and then we have other times where there is lots of water in lots of areas, including in Utah in the 80s. Right, um, and so is is there a possibility of some sort of of, of kind of nation? wide pipeline system that would allow us to move water from one place to another as climate changes and drought droughts occur in other places. So, so I don't know that this would just be kind of a Utah specific issue if it were to be done ever and, and, and feasible. I think it would have to be kind of a multi-state project where we're working together to bring where, water from where it's plentiful to, to where it's, it's not. Governor, back to inflation, do you think we've turned a corner at all on that issue? 
Uh, yeah, good, good question. We've asked our economists that, that same question, and they, the answer is usually we're not sure uh, that because there are so many things driving inflation. So uh, on the net kind of positive side, we are seeing gas prices start to come down, although um, Utah, as historically is the case, we're behind the rest of the nation for, for reasons that we've, we've talked about before. Um, so so there, there's still that, that piece that is, is coming down slower than we'd hoped, but it is coming down. So that's, that's a positive. Uh, the price of housing is still very, very high. And while we're seeing the price of housing come down a little bit as far as purchasing a house, um, that's mostly because we're, de we're destroying demand through um, interest rates, not because the demand is actually not there. People still want to buy houses. They, they just can't get loans uh, at a rate that is encouraging them to. And so you're sh starting to see rents tick up a little little more. So that's still uh, much higher than we would think. Um, I, we, we saw recently some economists pointed out that many, uh, Many of our retailers have over-ordered. They have excessive inventory. Part of that was because supply chains were so slow, so they ordered a lot. Um, people had a lot of, uh, of, of COVID relief money that they were spending. Now that's kind of gone away, and they have the, these inventory. So, so we suspect that heading into the winter season, we're going to see prices start to come down on some of that excessive inventory. So that will help with the inflation. But, but mostly what we're seeing now is that it's a mixed bag. Uh, Please. Governor, uh, Representatives Lyman and Romero have uh, floated potential legislation for mandatory reporting of uh, child sex abuse for all church leaders. Um, I guess I just want to get your take on that, and if that bill is proposed, you know, would that be something you would support? Yeah, with with the caveat that I always throw out there that uh, that I, I haven't seen any actual legislation, and and details really do matter in this space. Um, it, it is something that just kind of at a surface level that I would I would be interested in and uh, and willing to sign. We we um, we. We're deeply concerned uh, about uh, abuse wherever it occurs, and, and we, I think we all have a duty to speak out and to protect our, our children, uh, our, our most vulnerable, and uh, if this is something that would help that, then we should, we should all be supportive of it. Okay. Looks like we're good to, to wrap up. Thank okay. you so much for, for joining us. Well, let, let me thank all of you again um, for the uh, for the great work that you do. I, I hope you've had a, um, I, I hope, I really hope you did have a wonderful summer. Hope it's not over yet. Uh, Labor Day's not here, so you got a little time left. Go out and enjoy it. Um, I The only thing I would ask, I started speaking about um, suicide prevention. I know you all know this, but if, if you could just always include um, those resources in anything that you write so that as people read your articles or click on those links that they have, uh, they have easy access to finding those. With that, um, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.